In 1935, Stravinsky visited America for the first time, and he was asked to write something for the newly founded American Ballet, where Georges Balanchine was employed as choreographer. Stravinsky loved games. Chinese checkers and poker were especial favorites, particularly after dinner. So for the ballet, he invented a scenario in which the characters are the chief cards. The music is set in three deals or movements, with the Joker constantly playing games and outwitting everybody else by his ability to turn into any card. But finally, he's beaten by a royal flush in hearts. By the 1930s, Stravinsky was writing neoclassical music. That is music that was often based on formal or aesthetic models from the 18th and early 19th centuries. A game of cards is packed full of quotations or allusions, almost quotations, from many famous pieces. If you listen carefully, you'll be able to catch Beethoven's Eighth Symphony, Strauss's Overture to Die Fledermaus, La Valse by Ravel, and most famously, Rossini's Overture to the Barber of Seville. So see how many you can spot. Rachmaninoff is the last in a grand tradition of Russian Romanticism. Think Rimsky-Korsakov and Tchaikovsky. But he kept writing in this romantic idiom long after the most famous Russian composer of the day, Stravinsky, had moved on to other things. Rachmaninoff is most famous for his early pre-World War II piano concertos and symphonies, which are full of lush harmonies and long-breathed beautiful melodies. But by the 1930s, his style had changed to something much leaner and more concentrated the fourth piano concerto, the symphonic dances, and this rhapsody on a theme of Paganini have a tighter musical construction with more incisive rhythms. The rhapsody is perhaps Rachmaninoff's greatest masterpiece. It's incredibly brilliant in its construction and inventiveness. It's a set of 24 variations on the last of Nikolai Paganini's 24 caprices for violin. Well, it's a set of variations. Variations take a tune or a theme and alter it slightly at first and gradually much more as each consecutive variation takes place. First we'll hear Paganini's theme and then Rachmaninoff sets about varying it little by little. By the time we reach the 18th variation, he turns the melody completely upside down and transforms it into a lush, gorgeous, romantic song. During his lifetime, Paganini's violin playing was so virtuosic, people thought he was in league with the devil. So Rachmaninoff leans into that and his own Russian Orthodox faith by combining Paganini's theme with the DA's era, the Day of Judgment, plain song. For these performances, we're delighted to welcome back Russian-American pianist Natasha Peremsky. What is the pathetic about? The million dollar question. Well, let's start with what the piece isn't. First of all, the title doesn't mean pathetic. A better translation would be passionate. Then there are many apocryphal stories about the circumstances surrounding its creation. That Tchaikovsky was forced to commit suicide by an honor court. That he deliberately drank a glass of unboiled water in order to get cholera to kill himself. But one thing is for sure, the piece is not a suicide note. Tchaikovsky was overjoyed when he finished it, telling his brother that it was the best thing he'd ever written. It's a piece about forbidden love. In Tchaikovsky's case, his homosexuality was gravely at odds with late 19th century Russian society. But more universally, it's also a piece about the struggle between the life force that wills us all to live and the inevitable demise of that energy, physically and emotionally. So despite not being about suicide, it is a piece about death, albeit a hugely energetic one. In many ways, the Pathétique is an anti-Beethoven symphony, the opposite of the joyful transcendence that ends most of Beethoven's works. I always think of the symphony as telling a story of someone looking back on his life. The first movement begins falteringly, as if we're beside a deathbed. Then we hear memories of what came before, striving activity, ambition, and most of all, love. But that love is always thwarted. In the case of the first movement, a gorgeous love theme is savagely interrupted by a scream from the whole orchestra. The second movement is a waltz, not in three, but in five, so that it rather limps along, 
but again, it's full of memories of passionate love. And the third movement is a march. Here we see our protagonist in the full bloom of life. Ambitious, confident, virile, perhaps even a little arrogant. And this movement is thrilling, often leading audiences to jump out of their seats with applause, thinking it's the end of the symphony. But it's ultimately a hollow ending, since we then plunge into the finale. Unlike most symphonic finales, the fourth movement is slow rather than fast, and that's the key to understanding the whole piece. We hear the pain caused by a love that cannot be enjoyed out in the open. Several times the finale depicts this love, ardent, beautiful, intoxicating, but it's always rebutted by music of creeping exhaustion, perhaps depicting the realization that the love will almost be impossible. This realization leads to the life force running out, and the symphony ends with a musical depiction of a heartbeat faltering in the double basses, gradually getting slower until it finally stops, ending in silence. Tchaikovsky knew that he had written something great, that he had redefined what a symphony could be and what it could express. Many later works by Mahler, Shostakovich and Sibelius would be impossible without the pathétique. It's a piece that allows us to contemplate the eternal questions of life and death and love. And strangely, after a performance, despite the bleakness of the ending, it's love that remains with you. <laughs>